you're a beginner, you've never programmed before in your life, you want to learn Python, you're wondering how. Can this be done in 60 minutes? Absolutely it can be done in 60 minutes. If you're interested, stay tuned. Welcome, so you've chosen to learn Python in 60 minutes. It can be done. I've created a presentation for you. We're gonna go through the whole presentation. I'm gonna take you through some code and you're more than welcome to download the presentation anytime you want. Otherwise, let's get started. The first thing you're going to need is an integrated development environment. Either you can choose PyCharm or you can choose Visual Studio Code. PyCharm is my personal favorite. That's what I'll be using in this demonstrations. And I've chosen to go with a community edition purely because it's 100% free and all of you can use this. The hyperlink to download PyCharm is available at this hyperlink here inside the PDF that I've provided you. And also the getting started instructions are available in this hyperlink. Once you get to the page, you'll choose the version of download you want and proceed to the download. Same goes for Visual Studio. This is a program developed by Microsoft and it's actually quite popular because it's very well favored by developers around the world because it doesn't just do Python programming, it can handle all programming languages and that is quite useful as a development platform. You can download Visual Studio code from this hyperlink provided and getting started with the installation process with this hyperlink. That's also provided in the PDF that I've given you. Let's take a look at the websites so you can see what I'm talking about. So the first thing is you're going to see PyCharm available under jetbrains.com forward slash PyCharm forward slash download. This is where you will choose the correct version for yourself. If you want to go and use the professional version, you can, but you'll have to pay for that. However, you can, you can still use it for 30 days for free. I would probably just go for the PyCharm Community Edition. It's more than enough in terms of learning Python and writing very cool applications. Pick the right version for yourself. I, put, I picked the Apple Silicon because that's what I'm using and download and proceed with the installation. Same goes for Visual Studio. Visual Studio is available at code.visualstudio.com and you can pick the version that you want to do the installation with and you should be okay when you follow the instructions for the installation process. Relatively easy, both of them are very easy to do the installation. Okay, what you're gonna need to do next is to set up your application. Now, when you install PyCharm, after you've done the installation, create a new project. So you'll go file new project, give it a name, Okay, then choose the right path for the environment files in the project. Usually you can just leave that as default. It tends to pick the right location for that. And then of course, those files are used so that it can manage the project that you're working on when it comes to PyCharm. The other thing that's very important as well is to choose the correct base interpreter. Okay, the base interpreter is critical. Basically that points to the correct version that you're gonna be using in PyCharm. Now, at currently right now, this particular version you'll be using is 3.12, okay? Don't worry about what it says over here. That'll be at 3.12. So it'll say 3.12 and it'll be that version of Python. Just make sure that that's done correctly on your side. If you're doing a Visual Studio Code installation rather, after you've installed Visual Studio Code, make sure you install the Python extensions. The hyperlink is provided here and also in your presentation and then check that Python interpreter is running that specific version. This is very simple to do. You can just type pi space hyphen three or dash three and then hyphen hyphen version. And that's in the command line. And that'll tell you whether you're using the correct version of Python or not. You'll do the installation of the actual extensions and you'll go inside your Visual Studio code, look at your, your extensions area and make sure that everything is fully installed and operational. Once it's operational, you'll get to see it says uninstall and disable available. Then you know it's been installed correctly. Okay, so you're ready. Let's begin the journey to your learning Python in 30 minutes, right? So we're gonna start with the first function we're gonna work with. Let me take you into it. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at the print function. Now print is very popular. It's used all the time in your code. And it's a very simple function. It's a built-in function in Python. It's gonna allow you to actually output text and data. Sometimes it's a variable or something like that to the actual console or to the system that you're working with. 
And the syntax is very easy. You just use the print statement, you open your brackets, you put your, your message in double quotes and you close your brackets. Now you could have variables in there, so you don't need the quotes for that, but we'll get to that later. And it's quite versatile. You're gonna use this a lot. It's quite traditional. And this is something we do all the time in Python. So let me take you into the code so you can see what happens. All right, so let's go to the project. Let's right click and create a new Python file. Let's call the Python file hello world.py. Inside this file, we can create a simple print statement. We're going to type print, open parentheses or brackets, and then double quotes. You can put in your message. And once we're done, we can hit the run command inside PyCharm and we can run this and print out the details of hello world as a string on the terminal so you can see it's working. You're going to use this quite often inside Python when you're programming. So now that we've done the print statement, let's take a look at the next function. So what we're going to do now is well, let's talk about variables. So what are variables? You see, storing data in Python can be done in different ways. One of the best ways is to use a variable. A variable is basically a placeholder, a container for storing data values, but you use that in your code and you can assign a value to that variable and you can assign a value to that container to that particular placeholder by using the equals operator. Yeah, very simple. It's used a lot in other programming languages as well. And then you use the actual um, assigned value uh, in the rest of the code. So it can be used throughout the system. So you can refer to that variable somewhere else. So you could say age equals a particular age, 25, and then that age can be used everywhere else inside your program. Now, <clears throat> what you can also then do is you can take a variable and you can update it and change your program as it's running. So that's pretty cool. So as you can see from the example, we've got name equals Alice. We have age equals 25. Alice being a text string, 25 being an integer number, and then the print statement, oh, my name is, and then the name has been passed in as a variable, and then again, a bit of string, and I am, and then again, the age as in a variable, and then the years old as a string. So what we're doing is we're concatenating that string. Let's take a look at the code and let's see how that works. All right, so let's go back to this Python project. Let's create a new file. This time, let's call the file variables.py. Okay, in this file, we can create some variables. We'll make a variable called name and we'll give it the value Alice in double quotes, so it's a string. Then we'll make another variable of age and we'll make that a variable of 25, that's a physical integer, a number. And we'll have a print statement that says print and then let's open the brackets, double quotes, my name is, and then we'll put the name of the Alice that we're passing in as a, as a variable. And I am, and we'll write the, the age variable as well, which will be the 25, and we'll type the years old as the end of that particular string. Very simply, it's gonna take those two variables, name and age, and print them out in that print statement in a very simple way. It's going to concatenate the strings and the two variables name and age into a singular output. So what we can do now is actually run and execute this tool, this little script, and you can see the print statement prints out the information correctly. Now that you've taken a look at the print function and you've also seen variables, and we said, okay, we can have variables as containers or storage location to put data into it, a string or a value. Let's take a look at the data types that you can actually use for those variables because there's different types of data types. So let me take you into it. All right, so what we can do with this data types, these are the building blocks of Python. So essentially what we can have is an integer, which is a complete number, so a value like 25, and it doesn't have any fractions. Or we could have a float, and this is a number with decimal points. So it's like a fraction. So say pi is equal to 3.14. And we can have strings. Strings is a text, all right? But it's still a data type. It's still a value. It's just a string value rather than a number. So in this little example, we have a number as an integer, number 10, a number as a float, 3.14 as an example. And then we've also got another type of data type, which I'm not indicating in the output, but it's a type of data type input, and that is 
a boolean so we're saying is true equals to true okay so when it's true equals to true you'll see how this works and then the message it's a little text string hello python so let's take a look at the code and see how this actually works for this example we can go to the project let's create a new python file let's call this python file data types.py we're going to create a couple of data types here so we're going to start off with an integer which is a number and let's make that equal to 10 we're going to make a float of a number which is actually a type of decimal but it is it's got fractions so it's 3.14 for example we'll make a boolean type which will be is true equals to true and we'll make another type of data type called message which in this case of course is a string and we'll put that in double quotes hello python and these are just different data types integers floats boolean and strings and we'll just do a print statement and we'll print each one out i'm going to run and execute this code you'll see it prints out a 10 it prints out the 10 for the integer let's change that to the float and re-execute the file and you see it's printing out the 3.14 so showing you a, a decimal with a fraction in this case we're going to print out the boolean and it should say true voila and once again if we print out obviously a text message which is a data type it'll print out the string hello python this is very often used in your python programming the next phase in your journey is to actually understand operators. Now, these operators are important because you've got the addition, the subtraction, the multiplication, and the division. So let's take a look at that. Let me take you into this. So what we're looking at is an addition, which is basically you're adding two values together. A subtraction where you actually subtract the one value from another value. Easy stuff, right? Simple mathematics. And the multiplication is when you multiply the two values together and the division is when you divide one value by another. So in Python, we work with the variables. So we say x equals to five and y equals to three as an example. And then I'm writing here sum equals x plus y. So that's the addition. Difference is basically x minus y. Then the product is obviously the multiplication. So x multiplied by y, we use the asterisk for that. And then we wanna say a little bit of a Boolean is greater than so x greater than y that's the comparison all right so that's kind of like how we figure that out and we've got addition subtraction multiplication and the division is kind of the same thing as if you're doing something like comparison you can actually figure out what's less and what's not division is the same thing you just use the division sign so let's take a look at the code and let's see how this works we open up the project and we go in to create a new python file this time let's call it operators.py let's create an operator we'll say x equals to 5 and y equals to 3 so these are two variables let's make an operator and say sum equals to x plus y which will add the two numbers together let's make another one call it difference and we'll say x minus y so once again, it'll take those two variables and subtract one from the other. Let's make another variable and call it product and equals that to x multiplied by y. And we'll make another one is greater. And we'll say that equals to x is greater than y. That's uh, Boolean. Let's print out the statement of sum. And let's execute and run this command. You'll see it's obviously five and three equals eight. Let's now print out the difference variable and see what's inside that value. And you can see five minus three is equal to two. If we now print out the product, this should multiply the two together. And once we execute or re-execute, you'll see 15. Five times three is 15, right? And we will also now print out the statement of is greater. So we can see that it's Boolean and it should be greater. Yes, it's true, because 5 is definitely bigger than 3. As you can see, though, you'll see from the code that sum is actually underlined. It's probably because it's actually a type of name that is actually referenced and registered by Python. So we're just going to cause and change that to total, and that should work quite fine from now on.
Keep that in mind when you're writing code. Let's get a little bit deeper with Python now and let's learn something really cool. One of the things that you can do is to create lists or a dictionary. And essentially the idea is that you're adding lots of items, lots of those data types inside a list of types. And essentially you can access any one of those lists or one of those items in the list anytime you want. So we're gonna take a look at lists and see how that works. So <clears throat> the idea is that you're storing multiple items in something like a variable. So let's say you're going to create. So essentially you're going to make a list and you're going to use your square brackets. The square brackets will allow you to set up a list of items. So let's say fruits equals and then square brackets. And we said apple, banana and cherry, all of those in quotes because they are strings. And then you close your square brackets. Now you've got three items in the list. You can access those three items and get the particular item you want out of that list. Now to do that, you use what we call an index. So because there's three items in the list, it begins as zero, one, and two. It always starts at zero. So if you said fruits, square brackets, zero, square brackets, that actually returns apple coming back because in this case, it's the first item in the index. And then you can also modify and you can change items in that particular list and you could say, fruits in square brackets number one and change that to orange. And when you do that, it's now gonna modify that entry in the list with whatever new entry you've put in. In this case, it's gonna take out the banana, which is the, the, the one. Remember zero is apple, banana is one. So it's gonna take banana and replace it with apple. Uh, sorry, in this case, orange, <laughs> my bad. And you can also add into the list. You could say, okay, and uh, you can append new items to the list. You can say fruits, dot append because fruits in this case will be a variable we can play with it's a list and inside that list we can say dot append it's an actual function inside now and we could say okay add a mango and that'll be another one on the list so you'll have apple banana cherry and mango if you haven't made any modifications of the orange obviously so let's take a look at the code and see how that works let's create a new file in the python project let's call this lists.py And let's create a list. We'll make a first list and we'll call it fruits. Let's put in there an apple, banana, and a cherry. So we'll make it into square brackets. We'll put apple in double quotes, separated by the next item in the list, uh, banana in double quotes. And then once again, the cherry in double quotes. We'll separate the three with the comma and close the square brackets. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then we'll print out the fruits list but this time we'll print out an index of zero in this case so we want to print out the apple one okay so in this case it's going to do it by index so if we said zero it's going to print out apple if we say banana it should well if we put a one it'll print out banana if we put a two it'll put out uh the cherry so this will access the elements by index and then what we can do is we can actually append to this particular list <clears throat> so in this case we'll take fruits that we created above and we'll append orange to that list so now obviously it's going to have four items in the list zero one two and three okay so we'll use this for pending i may have to sort of push the comment statements a bit further across but i'll do it afterwards so let's add an element to the list and uh, what we can do here is we can print out the length of the fruits list. Okay, so we can actually see what's inside that particular list. Let's push the comment tabs a bit further. I'll do it for the other three as well. Well, the other two as well. So let's get the length of the list. Let's also change the other two quickly. Change that one and that one. And now what we can do is we can execute this and you can see it's printing out apple and the number four, which is great. It's printing out four because there's four items in the list, but notice it printed out the first one in the index. So if we change that to a one, let's see if we change that to a one, it should print out banana. Okay. Again, there are four items in the list. If we change that to say 
the item number two, the index number two, that should print out cherry. So when we re-execute, it's printing out cherry. Okay. So as you can see, we're printing out from the list. But we are appending orange into this. We're definitely appending orange into it. Okay. So orange is part of the list. But obviously the first print statement won't know this because we're only appending after the first print statement. So what we can do is if you actually take that particular line, right? So let's let's see if we if we go in there and we decide, okay, we're going to print out the fruits, but this time we're going to print out the number three. Now it's working, right? It's definitely printing out orange because we've appended that particular item into that list. It's now index number three. So it's the fourth item in the list. We always start at zero. If you actually try to do that before you append, of course you're going to get an error, right? You can see that Python is showing you an error. I mean, push this up a little further. It doesn't know. It doesn't have access to that index because it doesn't have that index, right? It's out of range because we didn't put that yet into that range. Okay, so of course we're not going to get the number three there because it's not in the range yet. It only comes into range after we append. Pretty simple. This is a great way of working with lists. You're going to use this quite often in your Python programming. One of the most popular things that you can do in Python is to work with conditionals. Conditions are very cool. Uh, one of my favorite things to write code with. And essentially it's a way to say, well, if this happens, then do this. And if that happens, do that. Right. So very popular in programming. All programming languages use conditionals and it's very cool for making decisions. So let's take a look at it. So what we're going to take a look at is just four different things. We're going to take a look at the if statement, which essentially it executes code if a condition is true. And if it's not, it's going to do something else. Then the else statement, it provides an alternative when the condition is false. OK, when it's not true. And then there's another type of statement called an L if it's not an else if a lot of other programming languages use else if in this case we use L if Python likes to shorten things because it likes to be efficient. And this actually checks multiple conditions in a particular sequence, which is quite interesting. It gets a little bit trickier later. We can cover that in a different uh, subject later. We're going to take a look at the basic details and then comparison type of operators and this is where it helps with conditions because you could have the uh, the double equals which means it's actually equal to something we could have the exclamation mark and equals which is not equal to exclamation mark means not something then we can have less than greater than uh, we could have greater than and equals to or less than or equals to these are allowing you to compare values so as you can see from the example, I've said age equals 18. And I've said if the age is greater than or equal to 18, print out a statement. You're an adult. And if not, in other words, else, colon. And then I said, OK, print, you're a minor. So let's take a look at this code and see how this works. Let's create a new file. This time, well, let's call this conditionals.py. We can create an age condition. Let's say the age condition is equal to 18. It's an integer of 18. And we'll say it will create an if statement. We'll say if the age is greater than or equal to 18, let's print out you are an adult. And if not, so else print out you are a minor. Okay. So if we execute this, we're going to get to see you're an adult, obviously, because the age is 18. So it's greater than or equal to 18. If we change that to 17, it should be a minor because it's below the 18. It's not equal to or anything greater. It's below 18, right? So if we now had to modify that operator, so let's say if we modify the condition, instead of greater than or equals to, what we can do here 
is we could change that and we could say, okay, how about we modify that? We say less than or equal to 18. Now, if we do that, actually, no, let's say if the age is less than or equal to 19, how about we do that? And then we can write there, we can just change the message and say, you are a teenager. Because obviously it's within the teens, right? 19. And if not, so else, you're an adult. So anything above 19 from 20 onwards, you're an adult. Now at the moment, 17 is definitely below the 19, right? So it's definitely a teenager. So if we change the age to the 18, it'll be the same, right? Still a teenager change that to the 19 well it's still less than or equal to so if now we change it to 20 you're an adult a pretty simple condition this is quite often used in python programming you'll get used to this it can get really complicated later but it's relatively easy to work with with python you can actually create a scenario where you can repeat certain tasks we can use loops for that Loops are very cool. It allows us to do sort, certain types of repetitive tasks and even certain types of decisions. So let's take a look at that. So in terms of repeating certain tasks, we can have a number of loop statements. I'm just going to show you two of them. For loop and the while loop. So the for loop, essentially what it does, it iterates over a particular sequence. It's got a known number of iterations. Okay and it's say for a particular range. And then let's say the while loop is something like it riles, sorry, it runs while the condition is actually true. All right? When it's not true, it stops. So it's got an unknown sort of number of iterations inside the loop. And you could say while count is say less than five, and then it carries on. So we've got some code here. We've set a bunch of numbers with a list, and we've said one, two, three, four, five in the numbers list. We've created a for loop statement and we've said for num, num is a number, it knows it's a type of number, in the numbers variable list, print the number. In other words, print, in this case, one, two, three, four, five. And then we've said count zero. So we're initializing the count. And then we go, okay, while count is, let's say, less than five, print out the word hello. So until it goes uh, past five, it's gonna send, it's gonna print out hello. So it should print out hello five times. And then how does it do that? Well, it says while count is less than five, print a statement, but then just after you print the statement, increment that counter. So the count from zero goes to one and then to two and then to three and then to four. The way you do the increment is by using an operator plus equals. And that means add a one in this case, add that counter every single time. So every time you go to the counter, add another one. And because it's doing it inside the loop, it's gonna increment and then eventually go past the number five. Let's take a look at the code and see how that works. In this example, let's make a file. Let's call this Python file loops.py. So we can create some loop statements. Let's create a numbers variable. We'll make that equals to a list of uh, square brackets of one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, close square brackets. Let's do a for loop. So we'll say for num in numbers. So for numbers inside the numbers, print out the statement num as in the number, print out the number. And let's count so we can do the increment of these numbers. So let's count to equals to zero. So let's set and initialize the counter to zero. And then we'll say while the count is less than five, let's print out the um, words, let's say, for example, hello. And uh, that should print out five hellos, basically. And then we'll say count plus and equals and then one. And what that'll do is it'll increment one, two, three, four, and five. So as soon as we ran that and executed it, you can see that it's printing out all the numbers at the top, one, two, three, four, five. That's what we asked it at the top where we said for num in numbers, print the num. We've now set that and initialize it to count zero. So it begins at zero and then it increments one after the other one. So it'll be zero, one, two, three, four, and then five. So it should print out five hellos. Hello, one, hello, two, hello, three, hello, four, hello, five. 
okay? Because it's still under the count of five, okay? So you can see how the incrementing works and how a for loop statement can work through that index and it'll loop out, print out those numbers and then that loop statement, while it's a particular count of less than five, it prints out the five hellos. Okay, now if I change that count to initialize instead of zero, to initialize at six and I re-execute, you see it's only going to print the top numbers at the top like we've said we want to print, but it won't print anything to do with hello because the count began at six and we said while count is less than five, print hello. So in this case it isn't less than five, so it won't print the words hello. It certainly won't print them out five times. So that's a very basic loop. Enjoy it. When you're writing code in Python, what you don't want to do is repeat code. You want to have reusable chunks of code so that you can actually use them anytime you want. Now, Python does a lot of that with its own functions, but how about you create your own function? So let's take a look at that. We're going to take a look at functions. The way you define functions inside Python is you use a definition, hence the word define. So you're going to create a function using the def command, def. And you're going to give it a function name and you're going to open up the brackets and then what you're going to do is that's where you're going to pass a parameter and then you close the brackets and you put a colon now when you do that it allows you to create something that you can call from anywhere else then the body of your code you can just write the functions code uh, that's the block code and then indent it under that definition so in this case we've got like a definition greet name and then close brackets. So the name is a variable. And then we could say print hello. And then we put the variable of name in there. And then we concatenate it with a last exclamation mark. And this should concatenate and print the greeting message. But the problem is we don't have a name, right? We've got to give it a variable. We could also use the return to specify the function's output. That's an optional thing you can do. So instead of just using a print command or a, the actual name of the function, you can use the return function. And then what you can do is you can call that function in your code and then pass up the arguments. So in this case, that's what I'm doing. Greet, and then I'm saying Alice, because I'm saying that's the function greet, and I'm passing it the variable Alice, and then this will call the function with the argument Alice. And the output should be hello Alice, right? Let's take a look at the code and see how that works. Let's create a new file. This time, let's call this file functions.py. Okay, functions are just code that you can actually call up from other areas of your code. It's like blocks of code. So let's create a definition. Def, greet, open brackets, name, close brackets, and colon. And let's print out the words hello comma and let's append a name that we're getting from the variable above from the definition and let's let's add to that text string an exclamation mark for example let's close the brackets and that should actually allow us to create a function that we can call from anywhere all right so in this case we're going to concatenate say a variable together with the print statement. In this case, it's going to be defined inside this definition greet. So it concatenates and prints the greeting. And now what we can do is we can type the greet and let's say Alice is the actual variable we're going to pass it in as the name. Okay, so we need to give it something. Otherwise, what are we going to greet as? And this will call the function above with the argument that it's passing into it, Alice. And that's what we're giving. We're giving the word Alice to that name function inside definition of greed. Okay. And now that should, once we execute this, it should say, hello, Alice, because we're passing in a variable inside that particular greed function. So we create the function above, that's the block of code, and then we execute it from below, greet and Alice, and we pass that variable into that definition. And then we print out the statement by concatenating the hello and the actual variable that we're passing it from the greet function and the actual variable at the bottom that we've said greet to, to pass it back. 
You can also see that sometimes you might get some code that may not be formatted right. It's probably going to need an extra line. This means that it's not conforming to the PIP guidelines of good programming. So just remember that if that happens to you in your programming, your PyCharm application will tell you that something's wrong. Okay, so let's end this little short tutorial by talking about how you can extend Python's power. So let's talk about modules. Let's extend Python by using a number of modules that are inside Python. One of the modules we can use is the math module. It's very cool. You can provide mathematical functions like sine, cos, pi, okay, which is really cool. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import that particular module into Python so that we don't have to recreate the wheel. So we say import and then space and then the math module. And then what we can do is we can do a number of calculations. I just did a couple of calculations here. I did a square root number, a cosine and a value of pi. So the first one is number equals 16. I said, I said okay, square root result equals math, the math module we've just imported dot square root. And then I'm passing that number 16 into that variable. And then I just print it out, square root of number, and I get the result out. Same goes for the cosine of zero as radians. So I said angle equals zero. Cos, cos value, in this case, say the math dot cos value and the angle we're passing it in, in this case, zero. And I'm just printing out cosine as the value. And then also let's try a little bit of pi. So we said pi value equals math dot pi. Uh, it knows that it's a 3.14 and then I just print out the par value. So let's take a look at how you can use the math module in your code. Let's begin by creating some modules. Let's start and create a file called math module. It's hyphenated math hyphen module.py. Let's import the math module so we don't have to reinvent the wheel and create everything to do with mathematics. So we're going to calculate the square root of say a number and in this case we're going to say number equals to say 16 and let's go and say okay we're going to do a square root result and let's make that equals to the math module and inside the math module the square root function and let's pass that number that we've just allocated above as a variable 16 into it and then what we can do is we can print out the words square root of say let's see uh we can say square root of 16 okay is Let's see, let's grab that. Okay, so we can concatenate the square root of the number that we're passing. And then we can say is in colon, we can say, okay, there's a square root result. Let's now see how this works. And what we can do is we can save it. We can execute that further down the line. Let's make one more calculation here. Let's calculate the cosine of say zero radians, all right? So let's create an angle, let's call it zero. And let's say co cosine value equals to the math module and its cosine function of the angle zero. And let's now print out the words cosine of say the angle zero in this case is well, whatever the radiance is, okay. And that will be, once it's printed out, a cosine value. Okay, now if we execute this code, we will see those details. But one more thing, how about we just make another type of math module? Let's look at pi, it's very often used in programming. So pi underscore value, let's make it a variable math module dot pi. And let's print out the pi value. Okay, so we can say print the value of pi is the semicolon, well, the colon, sorry, and we can say the pi value. All right, so now let's execute all three of these inside the script and see what happens. And then ta da, square root of 16 is the 
the cosine of zero radians is 1.0 in this case, and the value of pi is the 3.14. But if you notice, I've got a lot of spaces in my, art, my output. Uh, now, of course, the 16 is working, the square root's working, but there's quite a few spaces across the board. Even though the angle's working fine, the cosine is printing okay, the print statements, I've actually added too many spaces. You may need to recheck your code sometimes when you're writing code. In this case, everything's printing out fine. I'm just adding a couple of extra spaces where I don't need, because when you concatenate strings with variables, it actually will put the necessary spaces in for you. So let's let's go back. Let's go and edit the spaces. Let's take them out. We actually don't need them for this. I purposely wanted to show you this. When you're writing code, you can just streamline your programming. You can see that everything's kind of fixed, except there's one more left over. Actually, there's two more left over. One in there and one in there. And that should take care of that. And uh, now I've got one more left. There we go. And now the output is now clean. Keep that in mind when you're writing code in the future and creating code with modules. Another module we can use is the date time module. Very useful. And this will offer you the ability to work with date and timestamps, and you can also format those date and timestamps. So let's do this. We can say from date time, import date and time, import the function called date and time. And that's a module we can use. And we could say, okay, let's get the current date and time. We can say current date time equals date time, the module, dot now, open brackets, close brackets. And then we can print out the current date and time. But that's going to print out a very large number. Just not just the day, the month, the year and all that. It's going to print out months and, uh, sorry, uh, minutes and seconds and so on. As in computer minutes. But we, we, what we can do then is we can format the date and time. And we could say, okay, take, take the current date time and then dot string if format. In other words, string format date and time. And then we want to format it to year, month, day. Well, if you're in the UK, you say day, month, year. And then we can just print out the formatted date. So let's take a look at that in code. The next module we're going to create is uh, let's make a file and let's call this uh, date time module. Okay, dot pi. In this example, let's create a for a from statement. So from date time import date and time function, right? Because it's actually a built-in module inside Python. It won't pop up straight away. As soon as we start using it inside the code, it will come up correctly as a module. So let's get the current date and time. And let's use the variable current date time equals, and let's say date time dot now. Open brackets, close brackets. And let's print out the words current date and time. And then print out the variable current date time. Close the brackets. And if we execute that, you can get to see we're getting to print out the exact current date and time. And now this is like literally in uh, computer, mi computer minutes and seconds. Okay and date and time. But now let's do a little bit, bit, of, bit, of, bit of work with when it comes to formatting this date because it doesn't look so good. So let's format the uh, date. Oh, I'm being a banana, I typed the word the twice. Sorry about that. Okay, and let's use the format function. And let's say format a date. And let's take the current date time and let's say dot string, string sort of format time, open brackets, close brackets. And let's uh, put in there a format we want to use. So we can use capital the year, lowercase the M, and lowercase the day. So we use percentage signs to separate out that format, year, month, day, if that's the format you want to use. And then we can just print out formatted date and we could say okay then print out the formatted date all right now if we execute this you can get to see the output is printing out the way we asked with the correct syntax the year hyphen the month hyphen the date 
Now, you can always change this format accordingly the way you like using it. So just keep that in mind when using the date and time module. The next two modules we're going to use are two of my favorite modules uh, for this little short video because it allows me to do really cool things. So let's take a look at the random module first. So this, uh, this module allows you to sort of generate random numbers and you can actually make selections using that randomness, which is pretty cool. So we'll say import random and we can just generate a random number, let's say between one and 10, although you should be using larger numbers. And I'll just say random number equals, and then we can say random dot, random is the, the method, uh, the module, sorry. And we're gonna pull random integer one to 10. So just give us a random number between one and 10. That's a random integer one comma, and then 10, that's between one and 10. And then just print out that random number we're asking. And then we can also say, choose a random element from the list. So we can put fruits again, and say apple, banana, and cherry, very cool. And then we can say randomize, random fruit equals random dot choice, and then pass the list into that so it can randomly pick from the list of fruits that you have. And this should pick out a random fruit for you, which is pretty cool. You wanna see how that works in the code? Let's take a look at that. Okay, let's make another module. Let's create a new file. Let's call this file random hyphen uh, module dot pi. Okay, we can create some random numbers here. So let's import random from the function library, or in this case, the modules. And let's generate a random number between, say, one and, well, let's make it easy, 10. Let's uh, create a variable. Oh, uh, I'm um, Typing it in like an idiot, random number, but it doesn't matter. Random dot random integer. Okay. One all the way to 10. And uh, what we can do now is we can just print out, let's print out a string and say random number between one and 10 colon and then we can print out the random number <laughs> my bad you get the point though it's a variable right so it doesn't matter and random number between one and ten is eight now obviously every time you run this it'll create a different random number here we go number five is the next time run it again and number four is the next one pretty cool randomization really simple now let's uh, create another random uh type of module uh, approach so let's choose a random element from say a list okay so let's create that fruits list we did earlier so fruits and equals open brackets apple in square brackets double quoted uh, banana and let's add cherry and let's close the square brackets and then what we can do is we could say okay random underscore fruit equals to say random dot and then choice and then open brackets the fruits that we're pulling in as the random value let's print out the words random or randomly i should say selected fruit and let's print out random fruit and now if we execute this, it should print out randomly the word that it picks up from the list. In this case, it picked up cherry. Now, if we re-execute, it may not necessarily jump out of cherry because remember, it is random, right? And of course, there's only three items in this list. So it might not be as random as it should be, but it's fine. It's still random. If I keep on executing, it should at some point in time. There we go. It's picked up banana. Right, so it would be nice if we had a few more items in the list. It would just make it a little bit more randomized, a little bit easier to work with. So let's go back in. Let's change the fruits list. Let's add, say, orange. And let's add, let's see, what should we add? Mm, a melon. I may not be spelling melon correctly, but it's fine. And let's see if we can add one more. Uh... How about we add, say, something like Kiwi? Yeah, let's add Kiwi. All right, and then what we can do now is we can execute that and it's randomizing to Apple quite easily. It's still picking up the random number, no problem. 
and this time is going to cherry. It's got a lot more variables in the list to deal with. And the next time is melon, so you can see how randomly it's going. And finally, let's talk about one of my favorites, if not my favorite for this particular little tutorial, the OS module. You see, with the operating system module, you can use Python's power to dig into the operating system, which is really cool because you can start interacting with the directory and all the files that you have on your computer, not just doing stuff inside Python only. So we can say import OS very easily. Then we can let's, let's get the current directory. So we can say current directory equals OS dot get current working directory, CWD, open brackets, close brackets. And we can just print it out. We can just see what the current working directory is. Then what we can do is we can list the files and directories in that current directory. We can say directory contents and we say os.listdir and then that current directory. And we can just print the information out. So if you want to see how this works, it's pretty cool. Check out the code. Let's do a final module. Let's create a new file and let's call this OS module so we can start interacting with the operating system. And we'll just make a call and say import the OS module. And let's get the current working directory, which of course in this case is all these files that we have in this Python basics project folder. And I'll say current underscore directory equals OS dot get current working directory, open brackets, close brackets. And let's print out the words current directory colon, and then we can print out the current directory. Okay, let's execute that. And you can get to see that's the physical current directory. That's where I've got my project saved. All right, pretty simple. It's interacting with the operating system. Now, let's uh, do something else. Let's actually get the contents of that directory. So let's list out the files and directories in the current directory okay so let's use a variable let's create a variable let's call it directory underscore content or contents rather and then equals os dot list dir open brackets close brackets and then the current directory so we can actually list out what's in there and then let's print out the words directory contents colon uh, close that and then use a comma and then directory contents we can print out and now when we execute the file we'll not only print out the, the actual current working directory which is as you can see is at the top there okay but we're also printing out the actual content directory contents itself Right, so there we get to see the function files, the Python file, all these little files we've just created earlier. So we get to see the physical directory itself we're sitting in and the actual contents, whether they're files or folders inside this project. So a great way of using the OS module and a very easy way to do this. And you will use this module quite often when you want to interact with operating system functionality. It should bring out pretty much everything. So enjoy the OS module and thank you for watching. So for those of you who want to take on this challenge, it is a great way of actually learning Python. I took on upon this challenge to, to take Python and learn it as a language because I've learned other languages in the past and I wanted to learn it in a different way. So I decided to build a course around it in the way that I wanted to learn Python in the first place. So I treated it as a student approaching a course and I've built it in such a way that you can follow the course online. You have the ability to go through the stages. I take into very heavy depth on every single one of those topics and far more topics. There's five days in the course and it will take you through the whole process of learning Python from start all the way to finish at your own pace, self-paced, self-study with video, audio, and lots of examples. So you wanna take a look at the website? Let me show you. Okay, so here's the website. I'm taking you to ob.academy and you can actually see pretty much all the courses we have. 
But if you come to the site over here, you can see that the one you're interested in is the Certified Python Professional. You can either access it from the courses menu at the top here, or you can go straight to the link and just click it. Don't forget, you're going to get yourself a nice little discount code of 25% when you do this course. And this is any time you do any of these courses. So take a look at that course, break it down, see what it's worth it for you. And also don't forget the discount code. So let me take you into the curriculum so you can see what this Python course is all about. So I'll break it down into this structure so you can get to see some information behind this. This is the kind of view you're going to have inside the actual course. It's going to be very well structured, very easy to understand. Everything is bulleted. You don't actually have to take down any notes. All you've got to do is when you see all the code on the screen that you get to see, you will just write that code out on your side inside that program that you use. Obviously, PyCharm is the one I've used for this course as well. And if you come down here to the curriculum, you're going to get to see a beautiful breakdown of everything inside this course. So module one covers the Python primer. It shows you how to do all that setup again, gives you the Python internals, how to deal with built in functions, how to deal with the Py system for updating, how to do with the pip guidelines, as in like how you should develop things correctly according to what Python specifically asks for and the pip eight guidelines as well and best practices. Then we'll look at the basic building blocks, which are the things we spoke about today in this video, but I go into much more detail, obviously. The data types, variables, functions, user inputs and conditionals. That's all inside module two for basic building blocks. Things like loops and lists into much more depth. Tuples, very interesting stuff. And of course the modules, that's in module two itself. Then module three, object-oriented programming. Yes, you can write object-oriented programming. It's not designed for that, but you can if you want to. Then things like the classes inside OO programming and working with constructors and inheritance. Then all the way down into module four, which is the intermediary stuff, automation, iterators, generators, sequences, working with files, encoding and decoding that gets really quite cool regular expressions packaging and you, you want to package all your code into an application so you can do installations and then generating numbers and stuff and in module five working with data and the apis different types of apis application program interfaces with other systems online so we're going to look at working with data doing data analysis data visualization drawing graphs and charts with python data transformation and API hooks into the different APIs that you can use. Then for those of you into networking, like myself, I'm a security professional and IT professional. You want to do network programming. So you want to do sockets and threads. Absolutely. We're going to talk about that. We're going to take it also look at code management, how to do the testing, how to do the reporting, how to do analysis of your code. You're going to be working in teams one day. If you decide to take on board and become a programmer in Python or a software developer, and you want to work in the ability to not only just analyze your code, but you want to work with code management. You want to do things like source control, work with repositories. So we have to go through that and we have to also understand testing and reporting. And of course, not that Python is designed for graphical interfaces, but you can go to some extent when it comes to GUI sort of development. Although I would probably work with something like Figma or anything else that can design those layouts and then bring them into Python. We do mention it in this particular type of course, and I go very basic into graphical interfaces using something like T Kinter. And that's the great curriculum behind all this. So if you want to take your journey further than just the basics, as you can see, Python is very easy to use. It's a very easy and exceptionally powerful language to use. You want to go far beyond that? Attempt to do a challenge and try and do the course we've developed. If not, try and do other courses online, but enjoy your journey. I hope you have fun with it. This is Demetrius here again from OBPixel. Thank you for watching today. I hope you've learned something from this little short 30 minutes, I guess, tutorial on how to use Python and how to learn it.
and I hope that this is a great start to your journey in terms of Python programming for all of you out there who are beginners either in programming or even just in Python programming. And uh, thank you for my subscribers. Thank you for watching. Thank you to anyone new to my channel. I appreciate it a lot. If you're new to my channel and you haven't subscribed yet, click the little notification bell at the top and the subscribe. It really helps. It helps the algorithm sort of push my videos to other people. And it kind of tells you when I bring out a new video. Otherwise, thank you for your time. Much appreciated. Demetrius here again from OB Pixel and today from OB Dot Academy, my company that I build and develop courses for students just like myself and just like you. Signing out.